Dr. Rico here. This is an introduction to my mini course, Robotic Planning and Kinematics. The syllabus link and notes are in the description. All right, section 1.3, the bug one algorithm. The fact that the bug zero algorithm does not always find a path to the goal may not be too surprising. The algorithm is not making use of all of the capabilities of the robot. In particular, the algorithm does not use any memory nor does it use the distance to the goal. This observation motivates our second, smarter sensor-based algorithm for a more capable bug. And here is that algorithm, the bug one algorithm. While not at the goal, move towards the goal. If we hit an obstacle, circumnavigate it, moving to the left or right is unimportant, while circumnavigating, store in memory the minimum distance from the obstacle boundary to the goal, okay? Next, follow the boundary back to the boundary point with minimum distance to the goal, and go back there, depart, move towards the goal, and then if you hit another obstacle, do the same thing, and uh, hopefully we'll end up at our goal. Okay, so here are two successful executions of the bug one algorithm. We'll look at A first. So we start out at this point. This is the same world that we had in the first case, right? The same workspace, same obstacles. And we start out, we move toward the goal. We then decide to turn left, we circumnavigate, we're keeping track of what is the distance from the point that I'm currently at, say you're right here at this arrow tip, to the goal, what's that distance? Okay, you're keeping track of it, you continue all the way around, you circumnavigate the entire thing, back to our start point, and then you know what distance you need to go to get to the goal, so you just keep, you, you return along the same circumnavigation, and this time when you reach that minimum distance, you depart toward the goal, and then again, you repeat this process the next time around. Notice this time we're kind of circumnavigating each of these obstacles um, over one time, um, could be up to two times, so, or nearly two, just under two times. Note, the only difference between bug zero and bug one is the reaction to the obstacle encounter, i.e. the behavior inside the if command. Otherwise, it's the same. Okay, implementing bug one. The bug one algorithm can be implemented as follows. In the simplest version, when the robot hits an obstacle at P hit, it records the distance and direction to the goal. The robot then circumnavigates the obstacle, storing in memory a variable containing the minimum distance from its current position along the obstacle boundary to the goal. Regarding instruction four, let's go back and take a look at instruction four, which was here, circumnavigating it, etc. The circumnavigation is complete when the robot returns to the distance and direction it recorded at P hit. The robot then partially circumnavigates the obstacle a second time until its distance to the goal matches the minimum distance it has stored in memory. In a more sophisticated version, the robot would additionally measure the distance it travels while circumnavigating the obstacle and therefore return to the closest point along the boundary using the shorter of the clockwise and counterclockwise paths. It has those two options. It can go either clockwise back to that point or counterclockwise. It picks the shorter one in this more sophisticated version. An instrument for measuring distance traveled is known as a linear odometer. If the robot moves at constant speed, then a clock suffices as a linear odometer. You can just keep track of the time. Distance traveled is equal to speed times travel time. If the robot's speed is variable, then one typically uses encoders in the robot wheels to measure the number of wheel rotations. 
In summary, the Bug One robot must have memory for storing information about P hit and for computing P leave, and it benefits from, but does not require, a linear odometer, i.e. an instrument to measure traveled distance. Flowcharts. Before we proceed any further, it is useful to stop and discuss how to represent algorithms. So far, we have adopted the pseudocode representation, i.e. a simplified English-like language that is midway between English and computer programming. It is also useful to understand how to represent our algorithms using flowcharts. Since flowchart representations can become quite large, they're typically useful for only simple programs. According to Wikipedia, pseudocode is compact and informal high-level description of a computer programming algorithm that uses the structural conventions of a programming language but is intended for human reading rather than machine reading. According to Wikipedia, a flowchart is a type of diagram that represents an algorithm or process showing the steps as boxes of various kinds and their order by connecting these with arrows. Here are the four constitutive elements of a flowchart. A flowchart consists of four symbols shown in figure 1.5. Here they are. It can be thought of as a graphical language. Okay, so A, B, C, and D. A, these circles or ovals, represent the start and terminating point. B, arrows indicate the flow of control. So this shape, circle, square, or rectangle, or diamond. Then we flow from one to another through an arrow. This is the flow of the program. C, which is this, rectangles represent a single command, okay? And D, diamonds output two paths based on a binary question. Note, the dominant convention in drawing flowcharts is to have the flow of control go from left to right and top to bottom. Okay, left to right, top to bottom. Flowchart representation of the bug one algorithm. Let's take a look. So, start is at the top, we come down, and the algorithm says, okay, have we reached the goal yet? If we have, we end in success. Okay, starting and immediately reaching your goal and ending in success, that's winning right there. That's a, that's a good time. So, say you haven't yet. You just started. We start, we haven't yet reached the goal, so we say no. We take a step towards the goal, okay? That's what we do. We head toward the goal. Take a step toward the goal. Do we hit an obstacle? Okay, if no, we continue with this. If we reach the goal... Yes, we ended a success. We haven't reached the goal. We continue to take steps toward the goal. Okay. If we hit an obstacle along the way, we would answer yes to the hit obstacle. We would then circumnavigate the obstacle, keeping track of distance to the goal along the way. Move to the point closest to the goal, which we kept track of. Then decide, are you able to step toward the goal from that point? If yes, then return back up here. Have we reached the goal yet? If not, step again toward the goal, etc. Continue along this loop until we reach the goal. Or maybe you do this. You circumnavigate. You find your closest point where you're going to depart from the object. And you want to take a step toward the goal, but you can't. Okay, you're stuck. If that occurs, then we end in failure. That is possible. Okay, so if you examine the flowchart, it's possible to end in failure. This is indeed possible if the workspace is composed of disconnected components, that is, pieces 
of the free workspace that cannot be connected with a path, and the start and goal locations between the distinct disconnected components as shown in figure 1.7. So here we go. If you're in an entirely enclosed region in your workspace, there's no way to get from start to the goal and will end in failure. If you follow this algorithm, you would get to here, you would circumnavigate, you would decide, okay, maybe this point is the closest. It's a little hard to tell, but I think this point is the closest uh, in this corner. So we move back to that point. We try to take a step toward the goal, can't. We would have to go through the object, through the obstacle, and so therefore we end in failure. Okay, now let's consider the performance of the bug one algorithm. Next, let us begin to rigorously analyze this bug one algorithm. There are two desirable properties we wish to establish. Optimality with respect to some desirable metric and completeness, i.e. correctness in an appropriate sense. We begin with the simpler analysis, i.e. the study of optimality. We are interested in seeing how efficient is the algorithm in completing its task in a workspace with arbitrary obstacles. The question is, what is the length of the path generated by the bug one algorithm in going from start to goal? While a precise answer is hard to obtain in general, we can ask three more specific questions. One. Will bug one find the shortest path from start to goal? Two, how long will the path found by bug one be? Can we find a lower bound and an upper bound on the path length generated by bug one? And three, is there a workspace where the upper bound is required? In order to answer these mathematical questions, it is good to have some notation. So we define D, big D, to be the length of straight segment from start to goal, okay? If you drew a straight line from the start to the goal, what is the length of that? That's D. Perimeter of O sub I is the length of perimeter of the ith obstacle. Remember, we indexed the obstacles with a the subscript, so I is that subscript here. Theorem 2.1, performance of bug one. Consider a workspace with n obstacles and assume that the bug one algorithm finds a path to the goal. Assuming the robot is not equipped with a linear odometer, the following properties hold. One, bug one does not find the shortest path in general. Two, the path length generated by bug one is lower bounded by d. Remember the straight line distance from start to goal, as the crow flies maybe. Three, the path length generated by bug one is upper bounded by that straight line distance D plus twice the sum of the perimeters of all the obstacles. Okay, that's the upper bound to our path length. And four, the upper bound is reached in the workspace described in figure 1.8. Looking at 1.8, we have a start and we just barely encounter this obstacle. We circumnavigate it, we circumnavigate it essentially a second time completely before we take off toward the goal. So we go around the one obstacle twice, and so that is two times the sum of all the perimeters, which in this case is only one perimeter. So we go around this thing twice, which is why it's the upper bound of the bug one algorithm. Note, assume now that the robot is equipped with a linear odometer. After circumnavigating an obstacle, the robot can therefore move along the shorter of the two paths from hit point to leave point. In this case, the robot will travel at most half of the perimeter to return to the leave point and the upper bound on the path length can be strengthened to D, the straight line distance, plus three halves times the sum of the perimeters, okay? An example environment achieving this bound is shown on the right. So here we encounter the obstacle, we circumnavigate it all the way around once, 
we kept track, that we, so we're going to take the shortest path back, but it turns out that there's nothing shorter than going halfway around again, okay? And that's the case that we've got here. So now we've taken a look at the performance of the bug one algorithm. And next time we're going to introduce the bug two algorithm, the third and final algorithm of this chapter. I'll see you then.